to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, welcome to season two, or three. This is season three. Sorry. This is season year three. I'm sleep deprived. Okay, let's rewind this. Steve, we're going to start over. No, no, no. This is Just, going no, into the show. This is going into the show. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> welcome to year three, season three of the Commission Ed Podcast. We're going to start a series of episodes on kind of a big topic that Colin, you and I are wholly unqualified to comment on, mm -hmm. but, but we're going to do it anyway, but we've got to, we've got yep. to, the more we've started to explore this idea of what is a commission kind of, I don't know, commission ed, it's like the point of what we're talking about. Yeah. It's all started kind of to crystallize around this idea of the centrality of command. So today we're going to do kind of the nuts and bolts about what is a commander. So in typical yeah. form, we'll go through some AFIs, go through some, you know, US code, that kind of stuff, really riveting. But we'll also talk a little <laughs> bit about, we'll talk about kind of the unstated things, you know, our experiences, things we've observed, because we've all been around commanders. They're yeah. a critical part of an Air Force or military experience. So yeah, let's get to it. So Colin, when we think of commanders, what is a commander? Yeah, so there are a number of different types of commanders that it's usually prefaced by some sort of echelon, some sort of designator of where that command exists within the Air Force. So when we talk commander, we typically think of squadron commander. That's usually where people's minds will go when you say my commander, right? Yeah, the beating heart of the Air Force. You know, that's the central unit, the central organization. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it makes sense because squadrons are how the Air Force is organized. That's how missions are carried out. They're done at the squadron level, right? Yeah. And so it makes sense that squadron commander is the typical place that your mind will go when you hear that word. But there are many more positions that use the title of commander. And I'm just going to run through a quick list here to give you an idea of how many other types of commanders there are. Flight commander, detachment commander, squadron commander, group commander, wing and vice wing commanders, installation commanders, numbered air force commanders, MAGCOM commanders, and combatant commanders. So we see there the entire department of the air force, but outside of it in the combatant commands, the COCOMs, where command takes place, where air force officers are going to be functioning as a commander. Yeah. And this all makes sense, right? Chain of command starts at yep. the commander in chief, right? There's that word again. Mm -hmm. And goes, this is how the power and authority comes to you. It comes through this chain. Some other positions that function like commanders and may even have some of the responsibilities but don't have the title. You have commandants, you have adjutant generals, you have materiel leaders, that's in the acquisitions world, mm -hmm. chiefs and directors. Yeah, chiefs. Can we talk about that one real quick? Yeah, let's do that. Because we're not talking about chief master sergeants, right? We're talking about... Or the Navy rank of chief either. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chief often is used to designate someone who has a responsibility over some sort of part of a unit. So like think flight chief or branch chief or something like that, right? Yeah. Section chief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also chief of staff, right? Exactly. The chief of staff of the Air Force... That certainly is a command position, but he's not called a commander. Yeah. So all of these ways, yeah, this idea of a commander, there's this idea of like central figure in a position of power and authority in charge Yeah. at all levels. So I'm impressed that you did this math, Colin. Well done. There are <laughs> 780 command coded billets in the regular Air Force. I didn't do the math. Google did it for me. Okay. Well, good job, Google. But I'll take the credit. Thank you, Reed. Yeah, there you go. So this only includes positions that are boarded. 
And we'll do an episode about how commanders are selected and kind of what goes mm -hmm. into that to include some of the unwritten rules about how if you want to be a commander, you kind of got to do X, Y, and Z. And it also does not include any positions in the reserve components or flight command because flight command is not a boarded position. Honestly, it's just yeah. kind of, you could be a flight commander as a young second lieutenant and it's just the assignment that AFPC decided to give you. Right. Which is very interesting because that's not how it's done in the Army and the Marines. Maybe the Navy, I don't know that much about how command time as a CGO works for the Navy, but definitely in the Army and the Marines, company commanders are boarded positions. They are command coded billets. They are given G series orders, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So same grade, same pay structure, same, you know, rank title even, you know, we're all called captains at 03 in the Army, Marines, and in the Air Force. But those positions of company commanders are treated very differently from us in the Air Force as flight commanders. Yeah, totally different. They're almost more equivalent to a squadron commander as an right. 03 in those specific positions. Okay, so that's kind of the big hand, small map. What is a commander? Let's start getting into some of the actual rules. And there's surprisingly few, right? Yeah, this is one of those, like with the centrality of this position, one would think there'd be a little bit more written down, I guess. But I will say the things that are written down are written down in important places. Right, yep. So Colin, why don't you kick us off with kind of like the first thing about commanders that we find in the guidance? Yeah, so when you look for what the minimum requirements are to be a commander, you're not going to find much. What we did find was in Title 10, U.S. Code, Section 8074, 8074. Yeah, that's a deep cut, by the way. That's like, yeah. that's deep in the guidance. <laughs> yeah. You like, you really have to go looking for it. But once again, thank you, Google. So officers in the Air Force may be assigned to command various different Air Force activities, installations, and personnel based on the echelon or the area where they are going to have responsibility. So just like we ran through at the beginning of the episode, you know, all the way from the highest levels, major combatant command, all the way down to squadrons of flights, right? And to discharge those duties or functions authorized by law, officers are assigned certain duties or powers by the Secretary of the Air Force. Now, the translation of all of this is that in order to carry out those duties, in order to have those responsibilities for installations and personnel, you must be a commissioned officer, period, end dot, right? Yeah. So if you want to be a commander, okay, we're talking minimum requirements, thou shalt be a commissioned officer, right? Yeah, pretty straightforward. Now, there are some nuances that further stipulated in the law here. Now, moving on to another deep cut, Section 8,579, it talks about how officers who are in the medical, dental, veterinary, medical service corps, or biomedical, or also nurses, cannot be commanders in areas that are outside of their specific category, which is best just understood as non-line of the Air Force. Yeah, so... What we're getting at here is you're not going to see a nurse as a commander of an ops group. That's not a thing. They would need to be a commander over other medical non-line personnel. Yeah. And it was really interesting. I always thought that that was just like a heuristic, a shortcut, a way of just a more way, the way that we've always done things. It wasn't that they couldn't because of any sort of written down rule. Like that's just the way it was. Turns out, it's actually in the law that non-line officers cannot command line of the Air Force units. Yeah. Now, of note, there isn't a law preventing the other thing from happening. The vice, the vice versa of it. Yeah. Having a pilot or security forces or you pick your line of the Air Force being a commander over a medical group or something. Mm -hmm. That doesn't appear to be there. So... And that does happen. Not yeah. very often, but it does. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, the very specifics, like what can you command? It's pretty much wide open for a, a member of the line of the Air Force, much more restrictive for those outside of that. 
Okay, so if we keep going, there are a few more things that it does talk about in Title 10. This one's 8583. It talks about some qualities and responsibilities a little bit, not as much depth as you'd think. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But in order to be a commanding officer, you need to show yourself as a good example of virtue, honor, patriotism, and this one's interesting, subordination. Yeah. When I think of a commander, subordinate is not a word that comes to mind. Right. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, I fully understand and get behind being a good example of virtue, honor, and patriotism. Got it. Check. I like those ones. But being a good example of subordination? It took me by surprise. And I think we'll talk about it in a little bit here, but I thought that was interesting. So put a pin in that one, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Another one, vigilant in inspecting the conduct of all persons who are placed under their command. So they are responsible for making sure that the people in their area of responsibility within their unit, within their command, are conducting themselves the way that they're supposed to. And the next point there, number three, kind of feeds into that, that they are supposed to guard against and suppress all dissolute and immoral practices and to correct any sort of infractions against the laws and regulations of the Air Force. And this gets into the G series orders that commanders carry. And we'll explain that here in a little bit too. But it's just important to see that it's outlined here in law that commanders must inspect the actions that their people are carrying out on behalf of the unit. Yeah, and then correct them if they need to. Mm -hmm. And the last thing here in this section, take necessary and proper measures under the law, regulations, customs, the Air Force to promote, safeguard the morale, physical well-being, and general welfare of the persons under the charge or command. So they got to take care of their folks. Yeah. I think it's time, though, to kind of talk about this idea of G-series orders. We've mentioned this word a few times, but in order to fulfill these things we just talked about, right, inspect and correct according to law, mm -hmm. commanders are a little bit different. They have a few things that your normal run-of-the-mill doesn't have available to them. And I would add also to be the example of subordination, I think the G-Series plays a role in that too. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to start by defining what G-Series orders are. So you can find this in AFI 38 TAC 101. G-Series orders are used to announce and record command secession. So it's literally just this person is now the commander. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Yeah. What goes along with that is they now have been identified as someone who can exercise legal authority granted to them based on this role. Okay, so what is this legal authority? Well, what the legal authority that commanders have that normal, quote-unquote, normal officers don't have. Non-commander officers. Yep, is they can issue non-judicial punishment. Non-judicial punishment is exactly what it sounds like. There has not been a judge or a trial, and you can get punished according as they see fit within the bounds of the law, of course. Yeah. So what does that look like? That looks like you can get fined based on a percentage of your pay. You can lose rank. You can be confined. Like, they can make you go somewhere. Like, they confine you to quarters. Like, you can't yeah. leave your room. Admonition, reprimands, they can give you extra duties and otherwise restrict your movements or what you do. So they can, like, punish you. Mm -hmm. We keep saying you, but I don't want people that are listening thinking, hey, watch yourself because yeah. commanders are going to be coming after you. This is for those people we mentioned earlier, those that are infracting on the laws and regulations of the Air Force, and the commander has the responsibility to correct them. It's written in the law that the commander will correct those people. And it's this non-judicial punishment, these different ways of correcting that they're able to do that. Yeah. So yeah. it's not you, audience, that are in the wrong. Yes. But that's what commanders can do. Yeah. And we're not going to keep going on this point, right? This is not a discussion about good order and discipline and all the tools available to commanders and, you know, the 
the spectrum of discipline and punishment. Though is a worthy conversation to have. It's just not yes. one that we're going to do right now. Yeah, you know, we will do that one because that is a super crucial discussion. But in order for a commander to do all those things we've discussed, they have to have additional tools available to them. Yeah. And these are those tools. And should a member decide not to accept this non-judicial punishment, if they think that the commander is wrong and that I've not done anything wrong, then it goes to a court martial and that's a trial and that involves lawyers and that's a whole separate thing. And that's not what we're talking about with, you know, commander's responsibilities. Yeah. But yeah, so when you hear G series orders, it's literally a form, Air Force Form 35, that says so and so's the commander. Like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a whole AFI that goes into, I mean, it's pretty interesting, but that's what it means. It means this person has been given the legal authority to conduct NJP or non-judicial punishment. You may hear it called an Article 15. That's just mm -hmm. a portion of the UCMJ that allows commanders to do this. Right. Yeah. And we bring this up because we want to make it clear that these are the things that designate a commander as someone who is different from a non-commander officer. We all have a commission, right? We have all been granted authority, that special trust and confidence by virtue of meeting the minimum requirements of the Air Force as outlined in Title 10, Section 532, right? But they've been through another sort of process or selection that moves them into a different category of officer than everybody else. They've been through a board, they've been identified by the powers that be within the Air Force, they've been given G series orders that designates them as the commander. So that is important when you see, you know, two O sixes standing side by side with birds on their shoulder, but one of them has the command pin above their name tag, right? That says this one's the wing commander and this one's not. That matters. Yeah, it absolutely does. And just think about the concept. You can take someone's rank away. Mm -hmm. You can confine them. You can dock their pay. I mean, you have legal power and authority, and that's heavy. It's heavy stuff. And yet, Colin, as we talked about, there's not a whole lot of like how to. Right. There's not. A, there, so, <laughs> you know, we've talked about this before. AFI 1 TAC 2, right? Commander's responsibilities, accomplish the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, improve the unit. Nowhere in there does it say, what do you do when your airman gets a DUI? Right. Yeah. Now, they're not going to abandon you. There are people to help and guide you and to lead you through this process. There are squadron commanders courses. There are all these books, commanders in the law. You see those <laughs> in most commander's offices very well eared and, you know, yeah. thumbed through. They're using those quite a bit. Legal is there to help you. PA is there to help you. There are resources out there. But one of the things that I think is interesting, one of the reasons there isn't an AFI on, quote, how to command, is if you read the front pages of an AFI, there's almost always a section for commanders at every level, what they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's not one AFI, because you have all of them. Yeah, it's all AFIs. <laughs> it's, it's every single one. <laughs> Which is not us saying go read every single one, but more like just pay attention to the front matter of the AFI when you open it up. Don't just skip over it, especially if you are in a command position, because therein is your responsibility. Yeah, and there's going to be something in there that says, you know, local commanders or squadron commanders. And it, yeah. you may have stuff you got to do. Yeah, super interesting how there isn't like one location because it's all of it. Yeah. So no pressure. <laughs> You'll be fine. Oh, man. Good stuff. Okay, Reed, we've gotten really pedantic, as is our usual, about what is a commander and the things that are actually written down. But let's move more into the ethereal, the unstated things, the unwritten about what commanders are, right? Yeah, yeah. So... As we were prepping for this episode, I just started thinking back about every commander I've ever had. And at, you know, 10 years in, I've had a few. You've had a few, yeah. I had a few because at every position, you're going to have the equivalent of squadron, group, wing, and it goes up. You know, you have a lot and some you interact with more or less. And as I ran through the Rolodex, 
there are some things that kind of stuck out that seem to be trends that I thought would be good to discuss. And the first one is kind of more of just an interesting observation. I've only ever had one female squadron commander. Hmm. And I've also only had one other female commander. At any level. At any level. And that okay. was a component commander at PACAF. So the four-star commander of PACAF, General Lori Robinson, amazing human being, went on to be the geographic combatant commander over NORTHCOM, first ever mm -hmm. female. But that's it. And you've been in for you know, over 10 years now. Yeah, when I think commander, I think of a man. And I'm not making a judgment call on that, except that I think that's probably not the right ratio. Right. But that's kind of what I think about. Now, I've had vice wing commanders. I've had tons of supervisors, flight commanders, peers, but only one squadron commander. And that squadron commander was only for eight weeks. And I was basically hmm. on loan to that squadron. I was asked to finish out my OTS time by pulling one more flight, which was an awesome experience. And the squadron that the student squadron that I was assisting yeah. had a female commander. She was great. Really enjoyed working for her. But it, that's just something that kind of stuck out. Colin, what about you? Have you had female commanders? Yes, I have. But read your experience is not unique. So let me just share mine real quick. For the last year, have had a female squadron commander for the 8th Swiss. She is moving on from the squadron. And I'm getting a new squadron commander here in the next week and a half who is a male. But my experience with my current commander is that it was in a reserve squadron where both she and I are traditional reservists. And so my interactions with her have been very limited, right? Yeah. And, you know, fantastic human as far as I've gotten to know her. But because I'm a TR, she's a TR, and also because hashtag COVID, my interactions have been very limited. Also, like you, I had a senior level female commander who was the commander of the Air Force District of Washington. So she was a two star. And, you know, I had some interactions with her, but this was right when I came into the Air Force. I was a brand new second lieutenant. And, you know, by the time that I really had my bearings and understood what was going on, she had moved on to a new position. And, you know, since that time, yeah, I have not had very many. I have not even seen very many female squadron commanders. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I don't want to, you know, put too much, you know, reasoning into why that might be. But if we take a look at our second thought here on what commanders are, it's that they are busy and wildly so. Yeah, it's almost unnatural. Yeah. <laughs> and if you just think about like the demands on female officers, especially those that then later become mothers, it just feels like the demands on their time, their attention, their resources as a commander and as a wife or mother back at home, that they just feel incompatible. Now, I have absolutely every faith and confidence that there are women out there who are able to be both a squadron commander and a mother and do both very well. Yeah. I'm certain that that happens. I just haven't seen it very often. Yeah. And I wonder if because it's not seen very often, if that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in some form or regard. Mm -hmm. I know this is something our leadership is looking at. They've talked about it. Yeah. I want to be a part of that solution. I said earlier that I wasn't making a judgment call about this. It was just an observation. I am making a judgment call. I think we need more women in command. Oh, absolutely. And so... I'm eager to see how this develops. But like you, if you don't see it, that's what you start to think is a commander. Yeah. And so that was just something that I thought, you know, was worth talking about. And I don't have an answer to this. I think there are way, way bigger issues that underlie this that you brought up, right? And those types of topics and issues are not something that is only part of the Air Force. You know, reporting recently has shown that women lost more jobs during COVID than men because of childcare responsibilities. You know, these are way bigger issues than, than just affecting the DOD. So, but just an interesting thing. And we'll leave that there and go back to point number two. Yes, commanders are busy. That is universal. Mm -hmm. 
if you see a relaxed commander, it almost makes me nervous. <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's like, oh man, I bet that place is a dumpster fire. Like something's probably <laughs> wrong. <laughs> it's so uncommon. Now you have ROTC may be an exception just because of the different ops tempo or why did you have that written down here? Yeah, just because, you know, they often send, you know, senior officers to Air Force ROTC as detachment commanders for their final tour because that's a good place for them to end. You know, it's, I don't want to say that it's not high stakes, but it certainly is not high pressure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that would be my one caveat that I've seen among commanders is that ROTC is the one place where a commander can somewhat relax. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. And that's a good transition to our next point that I have found to be true is the more time I spend with commanders, the more I'm close to their day-to-day -day operations, the more I realize that they are dealing with a mountain of insanity. <laughs> they are dealing with so much crazy crap. It's unreal. And unless you spend a lot of time close to them, maybe as an exec or in a, you know, somewhat related leadership position, or you're in, you know, like you're close to the command team or whatever, yeah. unless you are in that type of position, you just have no clue the craziness they're dealing with daily. And as you were saying this, Reed, I had the thought that maybe that's why there are so few like AFI specific to command because there's no way that you can <laughs> encapsulate yes. all the crazy that every commander is going to have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. But I think that's why they're so busy is because this is just not written down. There is no book. And let's give some examples of what kind of crazy we're talking about. You mentioned one earlier. What do you do with an airman who gets rolled up for a DUI? Yeah. Now, I don't want to say that that's almost pedestrian, but that one is actually pretty vanilla. You know, you're <laughs> going to be able to turn to your now senior enlisted leader. That's going to be the, the name of the position instead of the superintendent. Your chief, you're going to be able to talk to the shirt, talk to JA, and they're going to have like script. Yeah. Now it gets different because all of the circumstances are different, right? And you have to balance, well, what did we do last time? What would I do in the future? You know, is this a super trooper who just made a dumb mistake? Or is this like the seventh time this guy or gal has done something dumb? And so there is a lot that goes into it. Let's take COVID. Yeah. How many commanders had plans? No script for that. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You wanted to do a book club? Nope. Barbecue? Nope. Professional development? Nope. You just wanted to see another human being from your squadron in person? Nope. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you prepare for that? But at the same time, that was exactly the point where General Goldfein was like, listen up, commanders. This is what we have chosen you for. Yeah. Now is the time to lead. Yes. Totally agree. Totally agree. But yeah, I bring this up because the more time I spend around commanders, the more empathy I have for them. And the more mm -hmm. I'm like, man, we should cut these folks a little bit of slack. Their life is kind of lousy. <laughs> <laughs> at least yeah, a little bit. But at the same time, and this gets to our next point, Reed, is that not all commanders are of the same caliber. You know, it's hit or miss, right? That over the course of a career, at any amount of time that you spend in the Air Force, you're going to interact with some really awesome commanders. And you're also going to find the bottom of the barrel where they're just, they're not good at command. They may be wonderful humans. They may be terrible humans. They're just not good at commanding. Yeah. And I've had the gamut, right? I will say the number of really bad commanders is a lot lower than the generally good. Right. If I had to put, you know, where is the mean on my scale? It's definitely on the better than crappy part of the scale. Yeah. You hope by the time that they have gotten to the point where there's going to be selected as commander, mm -hmm. you know, the chaff has burned away. They've separated or we're just not selected, mm -hmm. but you know, some will slip through the cracks and get into command positions, even though they're not ready for command. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. They're human beings too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that shows 
Right. And sometimes you wonder, how is this person a human? Because they are so incredible. They're able to take all of that crazy that's coming at them all the time and just handle it with a plum and just keep going. Yeah. You wonder, how are these people even functioning? Yeah. There have been those moments, right? We've all worked for those folks. Another thing that I think we ought to talk about is they are so incredibly responsible for the culture of their organization that they lead. Wait, wait, wait. You said culture, not the mission, not operations. Yeah. They don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. Let's just dispel that myth right now. So they are responsible for the culture, for the way people interact with each other, the feeling, the atmosphere, the camaraderie, just how people feel in that place when they are working together. Yes, they drive the mission. Yes, they make decisions. But man, so much of that is not up to you. Right. So much of that is not up to you. Yeah, so you're going to be in charge of this squadron. Guess what? Congress has decided they're going to no longer invest in that platform and you need to close this squadron down. Not up to you. Mm. Right? You have zero power to change that. But what you do have power over is how you make that happen. Are you going to shake your fist at the sky and be a, you know, super grumpy person the whole time that you're closing this organization down? Or are you going to honor the heritage and experience of the airmen who came before you and look toward the future? And, you know, like, that's what I'm talking about. You have so much power to influence the culture yeah. of your organization. Yeah, I like how you explained it. Yeah, but just not a whole lot over what you are asked to deal with. Your budget. You may enter into a fiscally constrained environment and be dead broke and be shaking trees all over the globe trying to find a couple hundred thousand dollars so you can hire a contractor. Or like go back to COVID. Yeah. Physically constrained environment. Yeah. Where you want to get everybody together, but you can't. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you still are responsible for how people interact, how they feel about their job, how they perform, because you are the commander. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Because that is very much not written into AFI one tech two, mm -hmm. right? It says nothing about culture in there. I mean, you could read into it inside the lead airman aspect, mm -hmm. but yeah, I can see exactly why you would say that they are unbelievably responsible for the culture of the organization. Well, and this is especially visible around changes of command. It can be incredibly stark, night and day difference over the period of 48 hours. Yeah. Yeah, I have had commanders, they were generally not great, that when they left, the whole organization like sighed a breath of relief and then changed as the new leadership took over. Yeah. And you had no idea the ominous feeling that was just permeating the organization until that person left. And you thought, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One person did that. One person created a culture where everyone was afraid to go to their leadership with problems. Mm. And we get one new person and someone says, oh, sir or ma'am, you know, I've got this issue. And they're like, oh, okay, well, what should we do about that? And everyone's like, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's up to you. It's up to you. So I just think that's a really interesting thing and something that's been a part of my experience. Well, let's talk about that a little bit further. So the commander obviously is the top of the command structure for that unit, right? Yeah. They are the, think of them as a figurehead. They're the person at the top. And if we go back to what it says in Title 10, where they're supposed to be that good example of virtue, honor, and patriotism, and subordination, right? Yeah. We see them being set up to represent this ideal that... Everybody is looking to them, and that's what they're supposed to follow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the commander is supposed to maintain that, uh, lack for a better word, perfect ideal for the duration of their tour, which is going to be, you know, two to three years long. I mean, no wonder that they're going to have this impact, this cultural effect on the organization, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then compound that 
with what we've already discussed, they are almost powerless to stop or steer the inertia of the Air Force above them. Mm. Oof. <laughs> so no wonder they're a little harried, a little busy, you know? Like, and we've used COVID, and that's almost like it's a crazy example. But, you know, think of another one. I was headed to the CAOC, and we were shutting down Afghanistan in 2014. That's what we were doing, stopping combat operations. Okay. I did my whole entire tour on Iraq because ISIS decided the enemy got a boat. Yeah. And so everything that we had built, everything we had planned, everything we were prepared for did not happen. Hmm. And so when the commander in chief said, thou shalt go into Syria and conduct operations, we saluted smartly and made it happen with half the manning that we needed to do that. Those commanders, they did not get to pick that. Right. So, yes, they're, quote, in charge. But are they really? <laughs> <laughs> they're in charge of their area of responsibility, their unit. Yeah. I mean, yes, there is such a thing as leading up. But the Air Force is so big. Yeah. And carries such inertia that we can't expect our commanders really at any level. I mean, maybe at the chief of staff level, you know, we'll see how things play out with General Brown and the accelerate change or lose. I hope he wins, right? I want this to happen. But at the same time, the inertia of the Air Force is so strong, especially when you're at the lowest level of the Air Force at the squadron. You're trying to affect change potentially at the group, at the wing, at the numbered Air Force, the MAGCOM, the combatant command, the entire Air Force. And you can't expect a lowly quote, lowly 05 lieutenant colonel to be the one to do that. Yeah. So I like what you said earlier. Let's cut them a little bit of slack. Yeah. Yes, hold them to the standard because it's written into law that they're supposed to be this example of virtue and honor and patriotism, subordination, but give them a little bit of slack because there's only so much that they can do. Yeah. I think that's a good transition point to something that I don't know. I'd like your thoughts on this. I think that command looks very lonely. Oh, 100%. Unless they are in an organization that has a lot of other commanders at their rank and position. So I'm in an organization with 18 squadrons. Okay. 18 squadrons, 1805 squadron commanders. Yeah. They've got a peer group. Yeah. But that's not very common, to be honest. Well, you know, the installations might. Installations might have commanders. Yeah, but at the day-to-day, -day, at the squadron, they don't have a peer group. Yeah. They are by themselves. They are the commander. They're not a commander of the squadron. They're the commander. And this makes me think of one of my most poignant and earliest memories of coming into the Air Force. This must have been like my first or second PT session, you know, unit PT with the squadron. And... In walks the commander. We haven't formed up or any done anything yet. It's still pretty informal. And he's going around talking to people, being social as any commander should, right? And I just, I'm watching these interactions take place. And I think to myself, mm, that looks like a lonely job. Mm -hmm. And I have zero experience in the Air Force at this point. I barely have had any conversations with the commander at this point. And yet I can see it. I can feel it. I can read it that those interactions, while they may be authentic, are also very distant. Yeah. Right? It's lonely at the top. That's what I was thinking the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, and I think this kind of leads us into our final point, which is kind of the kickoff for the reason why we're doing this whole series on command. Yeah. We have been told... And we're not going to make a judgment call here and now. That's what this next season is going to be about, right? Is talking about this idea. We have been told that this is what all officers should aspire to be. It's in our joint pubs. It's in our AFIs. It's in the way people talk. It's the way we give them parking spots. It's in everything that we do. Feels like officers are being told, this is what you should aspire to be, is a commander. You hear phrases like, there is no such thing as a bad command position. Any command is good. Mm -hmm. 
you hear senior leaders say, oh, my best job in the Air Force was a squadron commander. And yes, we are leaders, right? And this is the definition of leading. You actually have the power and authority to lead and affect change at an organization. But we've just given a bunch of reasons why I'm not really sure. <laughs> or, or maybe the way it's constructed right now makes it, this is a hard call. And so Colin, yeah. you and I, here we are, 10 year point or so. And this is something we're staring in the face when it comes to decisions. Well, yeah. And I've stated publicly on this podcast that I'm not sure that I want to be a commander. And that's almost Now do you sacrilege. understand why? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was there, Colin. I'm just... <laughs> because it's almost not allowed to say that out loud. You're almost not allowed to say that. Right. And I think that's something that we intend to explore this season is to ask those questions because... Colin, if we want anything, we want airmen to make good decisions. We yeah. want them to choose what success looks like. We want them to achieve their success. And so this is part of it. Well, and thank you, Reed, for being altruistic about it. But I personally am not feeling that right now. I'm doing this because I want to make a decision. I want to be informed so I can decide whether to put myself on a path to become a squadron commander. It may be too late for me. I don't know that. I think we're going to dig into a lot more of those things over the next few months. But you know, like, I'm in this for me. No offense, audience. I love you all. Thank you for listening. <laughs> but I'm in this to learn if I personally want to be a commander because I have not made that decision yet. And that's what we're hoping to do. And we hope that you, our audience, are asking yourselves that same question. We want you to join us on this journey. I think we've talked about a lot of interesting things. You know, so as you see those commanders and their fancy parking spots and, you know, <laughs> handing out coins and, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and all that. Yeah, exactly. All that. Just keep in mind, you know, they've got a hard job and yeah. a lot of responsibility. And we'll talk about this, I'm sure. You know, are they being adequately prepared? Do they have the tools? Honestly, with how well some of them are doing, something's going right, you know, because I've had some amazing commanders. And I'm interested in exploring this. We're hoping to bring you some interviews with some commanders, hopefully graduated ones, because as we've described, you know, the ones that are acting are a little busy. And hopefully they've had some space to kind of, you know, debrief themselves about how the command right. experience went. Anything else, Colin, before we wrap up this week? I know I just said that I'm in this for me, but thank you all for tuning in, for listening, being here with us, learning with us. And we invite you to join us in the discussion. Find us on social media, on our email address, airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. Join us in the Heritage Room where we're going to discuss these things in more detail between the episodes so that we can all learn together about what it means to be a commander, what it is that we can do to better prepare ourselves to be commanders if that's the direction that we wanna go. Please join us for these discussions because it's the best way that we're all going to learn. Awesome. That'll do it. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.